I think my biggest thing is, is it just a movement to, to get the neurons? I mean, all the, the stuff going on in your brain to actually reawaken and get back to the movement. I mean, cause she's moving well. It's just, I yeah. know that more movement is going to react all of that in the brain. And, um, I, it, is there any pressure on it? Is it, is it difficult to do? All of those um, are, you know what I'm saying? Is it just sure. a machine moving her or what is it we're looking sure. at? Good question. So let me, let me address this one way. I'm going to provide a very, very explicit answer to start with. And that's going to be uh, just doing movement, just having a robot or just having me, if I were to be there right, right there with you right now, me sitting there and moving your arm for hours and hours and hours a day will not help your brain improve, period. Will not help. Right. It may help alleviate tension. It may help alleviate some of that tone, right? It may, may even feel good. But those, those steps will not translate to improved function. What has to happen, okay. and I, I, pa I pause on that because that's a really, really important point. What has to happen if our goal, and this is why it's important to understand what the goals are, if our goal is to really improve function, what has to happen is we have to effectively recapitulate the learning process. Just remember how, if you ever watched a child learn how to walk again or, or learn how to walk or learn how to do a task, it's a series of really discoordinated movements that they just do over and over again. And then over time, they actually improve, right? You, you know, it takes about 12 to, you know, 15 right. months to learn how to walk. And it's not great walking at 12 to 15 months. And it takes years to improve that up to the point where maybe someone's running a hundred meter dash at record time right? It takes a long time to generate a motor right. network to actually be able to coordinate and, and have good movement. How does that work fundamentally? Well, it works fundamentally as we have a bunch of neurons that can operate in various sorts of modes. And over time, by nature of just doing random configurations of those neurons, and they will start to stabilize into a good performance, into a good sort of structure. And how does that work though? Well, it works by actually activating those neurons in various sequences and seeing the output. For instance, if I were, if I've never picked up a coffee cup before in my life, and I were to try to go pick up with my right hand this coffee cup, I'm presuming, Julian, that you can see me. Um, but if you were to pick out, a, you know, take my yes. hand and I would require, I would fire up a bunch of neurons. And let's say, for instance, I reached out and I missed the coffee cup, right? I wouldn't want to do that again and again and again, right. I would never actually hit the goal, right? But what has to happen right. is I have to know that I'm doing the movement badly and I have to know what I have to do differently. So instead, okay, so I, I went over here and I missed the coffee cup. Now I'm going to go over here and I missed the coffee cup. I'm going to continue to refine that process. And so you have to do these tasks over and over and over again to generate, to figure out the configuration of neurons that works, one. And then you have right. to do the task over and over and over again still to stabilize it so that every time that I want to pick up the coffee cup, I can continue to do that every single time reliably, every single time. And that's what's right. called generating a stable motor network. That process is what has to re be retaught after neurologic injury. Okay. And the only way to okay. do this is to actually be actively engaged in motor tasks, what we call repetitive task practice. And it's really just recapitulating the same thing that we do when we are young and we're just doing the tasks over and over and over again and giving feedback about whether or not it's good or bad. And that's the really, really critical aspect is right, is you have to know when the task is good, and when the task is bad or the, the execution of that task is bad. And that's where the feedback that the modus hand delivers is a great surrogate because it can tell you objectively when you're doing something well and when you're doing something poorly. And it does this not such in a critical way. It does this by telling you you're either completing the game or you're not completing the game. And that's, that's really kind of the, the fundamentals of it. And what's really, really important is, as I said earlier, just doing the movements is not sufficient. You have to be engaged in them. And that's why the, the actual device itself will help you walk through those exercises and complete the exercises. So you have to be, our brains have to be active in order to actually get the benefit out of it. And so that's, that, that. that's that fundamental step. Okay. So that any, makes any sense. Sort of, so yeah. how does it work? 
do you have video of how it works or? Sure, yeah, there's lots of videos online of how this works. Yeah, of course. Um, but fundamentally okay. here, I've got one here. Okay, so this is the exoskeleton that goes okay. on your arm, okay? And what it does is um, okay. you are conditioned on playing games. And so what happens is you put the device on, okay? Just like this, you put the device on. Yep. And there's a series of sensors on board that detect movement, okay? So such as your range of motion, and this okay. is how we can actually generate patterns. We know where you're moving. We also know how much force you're putting out, okay? And those those kind okay. of those signals help to be digitized and generate basically a virtual environment. And your movements, instead of trying to pick up a coffee cup, or for instance, you're you're playing games, and those games tell you objectively and quantitatively how much you're performing and whether or not those good movements are happening or not. And they give you cues to move in the correct direction. And so that that's the biofeedback. The biofeedback is delivered visually to you in the virtual environment. And okay. if you have trouble moving, there's actually a muscle inside of this that can contract and relax just like your muscles. So if you have trouble sort of starting a movement, which is often the case, it can kick in and provide some initial help. And if you have trouble completing, okay. if you have reduced range of motion, it can amplify any movements that you do have. So that is, okay. those are sort of the fundamentals of it. And so what it does is it helps you do these repetitive tasks. It gives you the training stimuli to learn off of. And by nature of being games, it's a bit easier to get the high doses because it's more fun. You're not sitting there lifting a coffee cup 300 times, 400 times a day, right? It's, it's just playing <laughs> games. Yeah. Which games so, can be helpful with cognitive too. Exactly. Cognitive yeah, issue. exactly. And we, so the truth be told, um, I'll be the first one to acknowledge where we have limits in the data we have. Now we haven't evaluated cognitive function per se. I think your intuition is exactly correct though. And that is that those, those games based on the complexity of their visual environments and having to do some troubleshooting and problem solving can help. But what we have evaluated is depressive symptoms. And we've seen that it actually helps people stay engaged and stay motivated and have re reductions in depressive symptoms as well. Now that may not be a problem um, um, for Jackie herself, but um, that, that can be a problem as we try to go through the path of neuro recovery because it, is, it can be protracted. Um, and so, uh, but, but you, I think your intuition is exactly correct though. Okay. All right. Yeah. Any other questions for me? I don't, I, I don't really, because I did talk to the girl quite extensively yesterday, Bianca, sure. I think her name was. Yeah, Bianca's and, great. Um, and um, I know that it's not necessarily covered by insurance, but you could, what I'm going to try and do is because of the lack of in-home therapists, I'm going to see with her insurance, whether or not they would actually agree. She does have better insurance than the average person. I'm going to see first sure. if they, will actually pay for it up front since we can't get in-home therapy sure and see if it will be an app they would take and then after that I, I just need to discuss with my husband if we want to look at doing this for um first try it for a month and see what we can do because i think it's she does need some um some some i think additional cognitive working with her hands and doing that stuff is going to improve a lot more than just doing you know we we get her up we walk her we do the same exercises they were doing with her in the acute facility and she is improving, but, um, she, she wants, and she's doing it fine. She wants to be back to the way she was. Cause she was, she didn't, she left every day. She drove every day at 77. Mm -hmm. She assisted her, her sister and friend. She's, this has been very hard. And I think the depressive part of it, I know what you're talking about. Cause every now and then she just breaks down and cries. I just want to yep. be like I was before. So yep. Um, yeah, we, I just neurologic see, injury is happened? exceptionally challenging, not only for, for Jackie, but because it does take away some of your autonomy, right? Those activities that you could do before, um, you know, with ease, right? We take, we take a lot of things for, for, right. a lot, you know, for granted. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's the, it's the, you know, I'm, I'm a therapist, you know, fundamentally too. And, you know, it's the little things, right? Being able to use the bathroom, right? To be able to do all the hygienic aspects, all that stuff is so challenging. And, you know, when you realize that this one snap incident can cause a big degradation in your, your performance, it really, it really can, can shake our, our, who we are.
So I very much resonate right. with that. And also too, the other big challenge is its effect on everyone else. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's caregivers involved, there's family and friends that are impacted by this, either directly or indirectly. And so, yeah, it's not simply that the individual that had the neurologic injury is affected. It's, um, there are network effects. And so, um, right. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm actually, when we took her out of the, the, um, no, the skill facility, we brought her to her house, but I'm having to spend so much time with her. I'm getting ready to probably move her to my house just so that I can get her to the doctor appointment she needs to go to and make sure that she's exercising like she should. It's just been, and, and, and everybody, everybody in my family's had to, you know, switch everything around, which is fine. We're all fine with that. But for me to uproot myself 42 miles from my house or my sister, 60 miles from her house, and then having to try and get here and spend, spend the night with her and stuff is just really hard. And I said, you know, it's just going to be a lot easier. <laughs> He's at my house. than always having to figure out where we're going to, you know, who's going to be there, how we're going to do it, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I know what you're talking about there. Yes. Yeah. And I think this is one of the reasons why we really focused on deploying systems into the home environment, because if we can get them into the home, it ends up being, you know, kind of addresses a lot of those barriers that you were, you were describing. So that can be very, very helpful. Right. So we could start with one, correct? Certainly. And then yeah. And that's the idea, right? The idea is that it's a, um, it's an iterative process. And at each step of the way, you guys are assenting to the next uh, step, right? And such that you, you guys right. make the informed decision of, hey, am I getting value out of this? If yes, continue. And then if no, you can return at any point. There's no, there's no problems about that. Okay. That's, that's from our perspective, okay. that's the much more ethical thing because we don't know how long someone's going to get benefits and how long someone's going to need it. Maybe they hit their goal in four or five, six months. Maybe they don't need it for 12 months or whatever it is. So that, that, that appears to be just right. a much more um, a, appropriate um, delivery method, I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now I just need to... On my on my end, I need to see what I, I can get the insurance to do since we're they will pay for in home therapy and we can't get it. This might be an avenue. I'm trying to see if they'll pay for it yeah, up front yeah. rather than having the full out of pocket. Yeah, and I think um, that's certainly a an avenue. I will just be I will caution you as to the probability of success there. I think many insurances are um, not covering this directly. And so it's just, you know, I don't know any individual, right. um, I don't know all of them. And so it's certainly worth asking them. I would just caution you as to whether or not that would be the, the, the highest probability of success. Um, I, I'm not, I, I don't have my, my hopes very high, but sure. I still want to try because yeah. she does have, um, my dad's insurance was always to Goodyear because he worked for Goodyear for 32 years and they've always had exceptional insurance. I mean, even the one lady I was talking to said, there's not a single person off the street that can just walk in and get this kind of insurance. I don't even think most businesses offer this kind of insurance anymore. Sure. Um, from just my, my own history of working for companies and having insurance in the past, it was never what they had and what they still have. So I would like to check with them and see if it would be an avenue they would make an exception for since we can't get in home therapy. And if they don't, then I'm just going to talk to my husband and see what we can do and see what we can, uh, if there's any way that we can start out with a month and see what it does and then make a decision based off that. Yeah, I think that's the best, probably the best path forward, right? It's one of these things that we don't want to necessarily delay things as much as possible, just because, right. you know, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of um, time since stroke matters as well. So, right. Yeah. So. Let me see here. You said that, are you the one I would get in contact with if we do this? So um, I'm certainly able to help. I think probably Bianca is going to be okay. the, the best person to, okay. um, to handle all those elements. She's going to know the logistics better, the timing and all of that. Um, okay. But yeah, if you wanted to work with me, I'm happy to do that. Um, and no, I mean, I have her, 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 um, I have her phone number in my phone. So that's fine. I just, it wasn't sure if I went back to her, if I went for you. So. Sure. No. Yeah. Um, I, I'm here in terms of on the, um, on 
the clinical science side. So okay. that's that's my role. And um, I'll, I will be sure to let Bianca know that we chatted and to, to let her know um, that we're able to kind of answer your question and explain things. And okay. if uh, I'll have her follow up with you guys as soon as possible and to see, okay. you know, what the kind of next steps are for you guys. Okay, I appreciate it. I really yeah, do. Of course. It's a lot better. Any, of course, if you have any further questions, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We're here to be a resource for you guys. Okay. Too. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.